Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world, everyone. I'm Emma Thompson. I'd like to welcome you to our World Harbour Project webinar. Um, this is the third in our series, and tonight we're delighted to have presentations from two of our partners. The first is Paul Brooks from University College Dublin, and he'll obviously discuss Dublin in, in Ireland. Um, uh, unfortunately, Emilio from Vigo in Spain was unable to join us tonight, so um, we welcome Jose Juanes from uh, Santander. Um, he's kindly stepped in at the last minute, and he is going to talk about Santander Bay in Spain. So, as usual, after the presentations, there will be an opportunity for you to ask any questions. You can either do this via the, the uh, question app, if you're only listening in, it, listening in um, and, or you can actually do it, we will unmute you and you can ask your question directly. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Paul Brooks from the University College Dublin. Over to you, Paul. Uh, good morning everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. The um, title of my talk today is Harbours and Ports in Different Contexts and the Potential Influence of Multiple Stressors and Climatic Change. So, in general, harbours have multimodal uses in which a myriad of human activities occur in unison with the biota and habitats that they contain. Those same general patterns occur with some degree of geographical variation in many harbours worldwide. But human activities are also affecting the environment and coastal ecosystems, particularly in areas which have high concentrations of human populations. In addition, harbours may also be subjected to stressors associated with global change, such as increased storminess, increased precipitation, and increased temperature. Multiple stressors can combine to affect ecosystems in a number of ways, and predicting those effects can be straightforward based on knowledge of effects of the single stressors in isolation. However, multiple stressors may also combine in un unpredictable non-additive ways, such as being antagonistic, where the combined effect of the stressors is less than the additive effect, or synergistic, where the combined effect is greater than the additive effect. That challenge is made all the greater when you consider that those effects can be modified either by the receiving environment or by ways in which stressors arrive into the system, such as in terms of their intensity, frequency, or timing. However, testing such modifiers of effects can be difficult in the field. At Malahide Marina here in Dublin, uh, Mark Brown, a former postdoc with the group now based in Sydney, and I developed a system for delivering control doses of multiple stressors to up to 150 plots in a field setting. This system involved 11 kilometres of tubing, 10 640 litre tanks, a kilometre of uh, electrical cable, a set of pumps controlled by programmable timers, and the original concept for this system came uh, from Mark Brown, and both of us worked very hard to bring it to life. This schematic just gives you a quick overview of that dosing system with a timer connected to a pump in a tank with your chosen stressor. That pump is then connected to a manifold which splits uh, that into 10 tubes that deliver that stressor uh, to those plots. So you can combine that with another tank with another stressor and another tank with some seawater uh, to use as a control. So already you have the basic components uh, of an experiment there. The research group here in Dublin have used that system in a number of experiments to look at the characteristics of the receiving environment. For example, Salonian crow and Kinsolan crow looked at the effects of copper and freshwater on establishing and mature fouling assemblages. Sylvia Saloni found uh, an effect of copper, but not freshwater, and weak interactive effects between those stressors. But she didn't find any effects uh, on the functioning of the, those uh, establishing assemblages. 
In contrast, on mature assemblages, uh, Chloe Kinsler also found an effect of copper, but only after three months. There were no interactive effects between those stressors, and there was an effect found on the functioning of the mature assemblages. In testing how variation in intensity or concentration of those stressors can modify their effects, this example relates to work done as part of my own PhD in collaboration with a number of people. Previously, most work looking at the effects of multiple stressors has been limited to binary intensities or concentrations of those stressors. And whilst providing valuable insight, these experiments have limited inference as to the types of interactions that may occur especially when applied to the real world. A better approach is to adopt a response surface design in which you vary the concentration of each stressor over a range of levels, which was very feasible using our dosing system. We measured those response variables at different levels of organization. At the inter-individual level, we measured cellular viability and copper accumulation in tissue. At the ecosystem level, we measured clearance rates and community respiration. The, uh, in terms of the results for cellular viability, single stressors reduced cellular viability as concentration of each stressor, stressor increased. However, for multiple stressors, there were increasing antagonisms across the concentrations. And these peaked at intermediate concentrations of biocide and high concentrations of copper. For copper accumulation in the tissue, when stressors were combined, there was a synergistic interaction between stressors, which peaked at intermediate concentrations of biocide and high concentrations of copper, such that those plots uh, accumulated more copper in their tissue than the single highest uh, copper treatments. In terms of clearance, clearance rates, uh, and in terms of single stressors, for biocide, the clearance rate uh, decreased with increasing concentrations, whereas for copper, there was a parabolic effect across concentrations. For the multiple stressor uh, treatments, uh, there was a synergistic interaction at intermediate and high concentrations of biocide and high copper. In terms of community respiration, for single stressors, there was a large effect which peaked at intermediate concentrations, and copper had very much a reduced effect at uh, single stressors. For multiple stressors, there was an antagonistic interactions at intermediate concentrations of biocide and increased concentrations of copper. In these next examples, we were interested in how variation in the timing and sequence of arrival of multiple stressors could alter their effects. So, we know that many stressors vary in their intensity through time, and it is well known that the pattern of variation of individual stressors can modify that influence. However, very little has been done to test how regimes of multiple stressors can affect that influence. Using our do dosing system, I set up a very large experiment imposing these regimes on fouling assemblages dominated by muscles. We imposed treatments where copper was the primary stressor, somewhere bi biocide was the primary stressor, and also included some appropriate controls all of which were subject to different time lags between those stressors. Those, those where there was no time lag, those where there was a short time lag uh, of a week, and those with a time lag of about three weeks between stressors. These were all then sampled either directly after dosing or two weeks after final dosing. Not shown here, but we also had additional treatments were also included to control for the fact that different treatments finished at different times, so to control for that temporal uh, uh, confounding that could occur. Again, we measured response variables across, <coughs> across different levels of organization. Uh, and what we found were that time lags between stress events increased that effect. So these were 
time lags with both short and long uh, 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 time lags between them increase the effect of those multiple stressors. In terms of uh, respiration and in terms of the sequence of stressors, this was also important. For respiration, it was copper first sequences that had the greater effect. For clearance rate, it was the biocide first uh, sequence that had a greater effect. In general, uh, time lags between stressors increased their effect. The sequence of stressors modified that impact. Uh, respiration, it was metal first. For uh, clearance, it was biocide first. And we also found that sampling regimes linking cause and effect were also important. Some of those effects didn't appear when we sampled directly after dosing uh, and only appeared uh, uh, later on when we sampled two weeks after dosing. In addition with the variation and timing of stressors, uh, these can also be modified with climatic change. Chloe Kinsella, uh, as part of her PhD research, tested how current and predicted rainfall patterns affected the biomass and functioning of fouling assemblages. These solid red lines or solid red arrows relate to the current patterns of rainfall and those hashed arrows relate to additional predicted rainfall uh, as predicted by climatic models. And these were then sampled at different times after exposure. The key finding was that increased frequency of extreme rainfall reduced biomass of those fouling assemblages and also reduced uh, their functioning in terms of the clearance rates, the amount of particles that they could clear out of the water. So in conclusion, we're very excited to be involved in the World Harvest Project and we aim to test some of these various contexts. For example, with our involvement in the tile en enhancement experiment, we initially aim to apparently test how the addition of enhancements and bivalves to artificial structures may change under varying scenarios of different stressor regimes, such as those that I've just spoken about. Thanks very much for lis listening. Uh, I'm going to pass over to Jose in Santander. Okay. Morning. Good night to everyone. Are you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, I will make a presentation of the Santander Bay. It's a more general presentation than the, the the one that Paul did before. Because, well, uh, in our case, uh, as you know, uh, today uh, Vigo, the port of Vigo, will present it uh, uh, today, but uh, Emilio couldn't come. And then uh, we tried to make a presentation together with the Harbor Project managers. But uh, at the end, because of the agenda of these uh, uh, colleagues, uh, couldn't come. And then I will present uh, a general view of the Santander Bay that at the same time is the Santander Harbor. Well, uh, we are here, we are just in the Gulf of Biscay, uh, just in the north, uh, in the northern part of Spain, that is called the Green Spain. Green Spain is because, yes, uh, you can see here, it is a small, a small fringe of uh, 60 kilometers wide. It's uh, the green part of Spain where we have uh, about uh, 1,300 uh, millimeters of rain every year. Uh, that's very different than uh, the rain uh, we, we get uh, in, the, in the southern part. Then uh, we are in this, uh, in this green area, and then that means that we have uh, a different situation in terms of uh, interactions between the, the activities, uh, the human activities in our area with the rain, because we have a lot of uh, uh, overflows in our systems. And then that means that the industries, in the case of the Santander Bay, uh, we had uh, important uh, problems with the overflows coming from the urban sanitation systems. Well, we are here in the, in the Santander, in the Santander uh, Bay, but at the same time you can see the three red lines 
that are the limit of the Santander Harbor. And then that means that uh, we will talk about uh, uh, a system that is a very uh, human system. Uh, that means that the, the activities uh, um, that have been developing in the, in the last centuries in this area has been a mix of uh, activities I will see later. Well, how is the Santander Bay? Santander Bay has different views. I like to put this uh, slide in which you can see, uh, yes, in the, in the right side, you can see the most touristic uh, view. I mean, that uh, are the, those are the, the beaches, the important beaches uh, in Santander with a um, high touristic value. In summer mainly, we have a, a very short summer, July and August, maybe September, but that's the, the high season is not uh, that uh, of the Canary Islands, it's just in the uh, green uh, Spain season. And you can see there the sun speed, that is the puntal that they will see later because uh, they have uh, different values as a touristic area and also as a, a nature conservation area. Uh, on, the, on the left, uh, you can see here the, the harbor. This is the, the inner part of the bay in which uh, you can see all the, the docks and areas for uh, cargo activities and so on. And just in the inner part, this, uh, you can see these uh, red uh, images in which uh, there are some small uh, rivers here and there are some uh, industrial activity in this inner part of the, of the bay. Uh, years ago, we have uh, some mines coming here, some in, in this area, and then uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, contamination of uh, iron, cadmium, and so on. But the most important uh, question for, for the bay, the Santander Bay, is uh, this uh, image I can, you, I, I can show you here, uh, in which uh, I can uh, interact with the um, Activity 3 of the World Harbor Project as the multi-use and multi-user area. This is uh, an, a very tight interaction between the harbor, the intertidal areas uh, for fishermen, for harvest uh, clam fishermen, uh, the conservation area that will be here, we'll see later, uh, the beaches, uh, the, the ships coming into the, the harbor, you have a lot of interactions between all of these guys, even traditional activities, uh, sport activities in all around the bay. That means that uh, we have a, ve a perfect pl place to analyze the multi-use and multi-user uh, interactions between different activities, different people. Well, um, you, uh, you, you have here the, the four images, the beaches, the harbor, the, the rocky areas in the area, in the, in the bay, and the, uh, some flat area where uh, fishermen catch a lot of uh, uh, mollusks, uh, clams and razor clams maybe, uh, mainly. Well, uh, what is the, sorry, the bay, the bay is, uh, is not the, the Sydney Bay, but this, uh, in our case, this uh, Santander Bay is one of the largest estuaries in the north coast of Spain. Uh, it's about uh, uh, 2,000, over 2,000 uh, hectares with a perimeter of 100 kilometers. For us, this is one of the largest uh, estuaries in, in the north coast of Spain and very important because of the activities and even for the conservation. Uh, that means that the, um, we have to consider this kind of estuaries in, in, our, in our system, in our region, even in the biogeographic region of the Gulf of Biscay because this kind of uh, uh, ecosystems are very valuable in terms of ecosystem services uh, in, in, this, uh, in this area. Well, uh, as you can see here, uh, mm, sorry, here. Uh, we have the intertidal areas in the bay are 67% of the, of the bay. That means that uh, it's uh, something like uh, uh, we have a harbor, an uh, important harbor in, in our region, uh, but uh, most of the story the, of the story is uh, intertidal area. That uh, means that it's not uh, very logic. But the, the main uh, harbor is just in the through the channel, the main channel, and the, the docks just in this area. Uh, in the main channel, we have about uh, 10, 15 meters. They have consumed about 13 meters just in the, in the main channel. 
and uh, these uh, depths are just very close to intertidal areas where we have in, in spring tides we have uh, all everything just uh, uh, dry. Well, that means that uh, we have uh, certain areas in which uh, uh, the, the velocity, the speed of uh, of the water is uh, higher just in the in this part. But the, at the same time, it's a well mixed estuary with a mean tidal range of 2.8 meters, and uh, a small river here, a small river in terms of uh, what uh, we call rivers in Europe, is a river with uh, an average uh, flow of 8.2 uh, cubic meters per second, with uh, maybe um, maximum flows of uh, 100, 200 uh, cubic meters. Uh, the maximum velocity of currents are just here in this part, just in the mouth of the river, in the, in the mouth of, of the estuary. In the case of the, of the estuary or the natural values, uh, the, the Santander Bay combine different, different uh, typologies of ecosystems. We have uh, marsh vegetation just in the inner part of the rivers uh, inside here. We have uh, intertidal flats uh, where the seagrasses, Ostera marina, Ostera non tea, uh, 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 appear. Uh, we have the sand pit with the dunes. Uh, we have cliffs. We have uh, two different uh, rocky areas that are including, uh, included in the in the in a conservation area. That's uh, the Mauro Island and the Santa Maria Island. That means that we have a lot of variety, the diversity of uh, species and habitats in this area. But uh, for this uh, mm, question, the most important place is uh, uh, one of the Natura 2000 sites. That means that it's included in the Natura 2000 network at the European level. And uh, this kind of network tried to preserve the conservation of, uh, of the certain habitats and species that had been declared at the European level as one of the most important uh, for, this, uh, for each biographic area. That means uh, you have uh, here the, the list of uh, different habitats included in this uh, place uh, that uh, combine the estuary habitats here, the sand, uh, the dunes, the rocky areas in the Moro Island, the cliffs, and so on. Well, from an uh, economic, socioeconomic point of view, the, the bay uh, has an important value for, for the beaches. This is a very, very important area for tourism, yes, in the Santander city here or in the cities of the small towns yes, uh, in, in, in front of, of Santander. And at the same time, we have uh, different uh, activities related to the tourism, mainly surf. There is some municipalities here that have declared the surf as one of the most important activities. But, uh, sorry, at the same time, uh, the bay, uh, Mm, it's a very nice place for different sport initiatives. Uh, two years ago, in, in 2014, there was the, the World uh, the Sailing World Championship in the Bay. Uh, there are some uh, traditional uh, activities, sport, uh, aquatic sports here, and so on. But as I told you, the, uh, the Bay has a, a big uh, intertidal area that is, uh, has been included in the European, uh, in the European uh, law of uh, fisheries area. And uh, we have a lot of activities of uh, traditional fishermen activities with clams, uh, razor clams, and different bait species. Uh, we have to consider that the, the bay, you can see here in red, the uh, reclaimed areas in the last 200 years. Then more or less 50% of the, of the bay has disappeared, just, uh, or has been used for the city, for the harbor, for the airport, uh, for different uh, agricultural activities and so on. And then this is an important uh, question regarding certain areas like this one, in which uh, we are trying to recover these areas uh, in the, for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, according to the European laws for, for sanitation, uh, Santander uh, took all the discharges from the bay to the, to the sea through a, um, a sewer system 
that uh, put everything here to the some treatment plan, and from the treatment plan uh, we discharge all the uh, seaweeds uh, to to the sea, to the Cantabric Sea, uh, through a submarine outfall. And then at this time, all the discharges uh, through the bay uh, is only five percent of the discharges that uh, uh, were uh, in 1998. That means that uh, we lost a lot of uh, food for the for the fisheries. And then that means that in the last ten years, uh, the clams uh, stocks has uh, decreased uh, very significantly. Well. Look at the next slide in which uh, here is the harbor. The harbor is uh, it's not a big harbor. It's a, uh, we have a very close from, from our city. We have Bilbao. We have another harbor that they compete with this one. But uh, somehow this uh, harbor is very is specialized in, you can see here, the cars. This is the, the cargo of, uh, of cars. And these cars go to Europe or to uh, to other, other countries as in the Mediterranean and so on. And then it's a very specialized, they move around five uh, uh, millions of tons of different different goods. But the, uh, the most important thing is that the, the, the harbor starts here in this part and now moves, moves just to the inner part of the bay. And then that uh, is the actual uh, delimitation of the, of the harbor. In this uh, port, we have uh, different commercial passengers, uh, different activities, and uh, the most important uh, question is that the interaction between the harbor and the other users is very, very important. Even if we have uh, this uh, harbor area, this is a, um, a graph in which we can summarize the different, uh, this uh, red uh, square, we have the, let's say, the ecological status of, of the bay, of the three water masses that we have, water bodies we have in the, in the bay, according to the European law of water. And then uh, that's the water of foreign directive. And uh, we can see in this graph that the, this part where the, fisher, the fisheries occur and the, the nature conservation area is uh, taking place, the quality is very nice. But uh, in the case of the harbor and in the inner part of the world, we have uh, some improvements uh, to, to carry out in the next years. Well, this is more or less the, a general overview of the, of the Santander Bay. But uh, for me, the most important question is that uh, this is a very good example of uh, some interactions, the, a multi-use and multi-user space in which uh, we have to make a, uh, some uh, a very nice govern governance because uh, we have to apply the maritime spatial planning or the integrated coastal zone management uh, initiatives that the European uh, law has uh, started just uh, with the last uh, directive. And then this is a very nice place in which we can, uh, let, let's say, we can uh, play in the interactions between harbors, the very high economic uh, sector, with uh, some traditional sectors of the fishermen, with the nature conservation, with uh, tourism, with uh, different activities in different municipalities. And then that means that this is a very interesting case for us, at least uh, for the uh, study of a, a bay and a harbor. And that's all. Uh, thank you very much for attention. Uh, thank you, Matt, for, for giving us the opportunity to show what is the Santa de Bay and uh, waiting for some questions if you have. Thank you very much, uh, both to Paul and Jose. They were excellent presentations, and I think we've all probably learnt a lot more about your respective. Um, harbours and, and ports tonight or today. Um, for the rest of our attendees, um, just to let you know or to remind you, if you click on the furthest right icon on, on the attendees list, it's got a kind of a thumb, and if you click on that, that will indicate to us that you want to ask a question, and then um, we can unmute, unmute you and you can ask your question directly. Um, so just whilst we're waiting for you to collect your thoughts and ask the questions, I just have a, a couple of questions for uh, one for each of you. Um, Jose, you talked a lot about the multiple users 
in Santander Bay and you also talked about the industrial activity that you have um, occurring there. Is this historical industrial activity or is this um, uh, commercial activity, industrial activity that you still have going on today? Well, we have both. Uh, we have uh, some of the mines that uh, have disappeared just in the last uh, 50, 60 years, but uh, we have now the effects of the, that activity because uh, just in the inner part of the bay, the, we have a lot of heavy metals there. But uh, there are some uh, activities, industrial activities, just around the harbor. Uh, there is some uh, metal, there are some hydrocarbons uh, company and so on. And uh, these uh, are just at, the, at, the, at this time working very, very actively. And uh, at the same time, we, ha we have to say that there, there is not a very important problem in the, in the quality of the water related to these activities. Okay, okay. So you think there's quite a lot of historical uh, pollution still left there, maybe locked up in the sediment from those, uh, from that industrial activity, uh, from uh, historical aspects? Yeah, we have uh, just in the inner part. That that's why we uh, separated three different water bodies, and then this the inner part uh, we uh, separated from the other two. One because it's subtidal, and the other one is intertidal. And then in this area is where we have uh, some uh, of the the most important contamination in this area. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. Okay, so we've had a question come in from Stuart Pearson. Um, it's for Paul, and it's a fairly long question, so please bear with me. It may have to go in, in um, sections. So, um, can this field uh, dosing setup be cleaned and used in other harbours? And is there a plan to do that? And the quick answer is yes, it can be cleaned uh, in terms of its mobility. It's 10, 10 uh, six, 640 litre tanks. So strictly speaking, yes, but there's 11 kilometres of cable associated with it, uh, of tubing, sorry, and a kilometre of cable. But you, potentially, yes, you could load it into a shipping container uh, and move it elsewhere. But most of the items that are used in it uh, can be commercially bought in most harbours, uh, in most cities, quite, quite relatively easy. The, the the setup can be fairly extensive, but I, I think it could be transported, but I think purchasing the items and matching the system in, in other harbours uh, would, would be a better option. And for somewhere in the region of between 15 and 20,000 euros is around about the, the setup cost. So it's not exorbitant uh, uh, cost in relation to it. And is your um, your methodology and your equipment has that already been published? Is is that available for people it, to do the same type of thing? It is uh, the the methodology uh, was published uh, last January in Method in Ecology and Evolution uh, in January. Yeah. Okay. And beautiful. If you flick back to my slides, uh, I can I can show you. Uh, uh, the name of that publication. So there you go. Uh, simulating regimes of chemical disturbance and testing impacts in ecosystems using a novel programmable dosing system. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Stuart's uh, continuation of his question, but it actually goes on to Jose this time. So, Jose, have you already, or would you in the future, use a standardized survey to discover the variety of user values and their ideas about the, de uh, about the desirable futures for Santander Bay? Well, we are trying to... Uh to in, uh, involve uh, the harbor, pro the harbor uh, managers with other stakeholders in the, in the bay in order to uh, start with a project all around the bay, uh, 
trying to give that uh, kind of product, try to start evaluating the, the different ecosystem services, the different activities, in order to sensibilize uh, people uh, for this kind of activities that maybe they are not uh, so much known uh, in terms of uh, what uh, kind of uh, uh, things uh, they provide to the human being. Okay, and then that's uh, an important initiative. And then uh, in the last uh, in the last year, there was an initiative from the harbor managers because uh, there is a, a real interactive problem in the bay. That is a small a small uh, channel going to the river where some uh, traditional ferries uh, go from the Santander city to the, this area. And then uh, because of uh, there is no dredging, uh, it seems that there is a, a, a problem with that area because now there is a, a nature conservation area. And uh, they ask uh, how much uh, uh, dredging could be possible uh, without uh, disturbing the, the natural habitats and so on. And then they start uh, talking to each other and then try to know uh, how to interact between different stakeholders and then try to uh, give value to these uh, systems. Okay. Cool. So um, also, Jose, um, is there mussel farming? Um, or gathering or fishing tradition in Santander Bay? There is no mussel farming. There is clam, extensive clam uh, harvesting, uh, clam, racer clam, and some bait species for fishers. And at the same time, there are some uh, areas in the bay, in the intertidal areas, that are concession, public concessions to the fishermen, and then they introduce there the seeds, and then they manage the, these areas as a intensive cultivation area, but it's uh, in the in the tidal flats, and it's uh, maybe soft species, uh, clams and razor clams. And and how large an area is that industry? Uh, in terms of money, or in terms of uh, production, or in terms of, in terms of space, in terms of production, um, and I guess in terms of value. Well, that's uh, an important question because uh, just in the last uh, five years, the, the stocks of uh, clams are declining and then it's a big uh, question between the different stakeholders in the Bay because uh, somehow the harbor always tried to say that uh, this is a very, it's not a valuable uh, activity just in the Bay, but uh, for us, uh, we, are, we understand that this is a very traditional, very uh, uh, cultural activity just for uh, centuries. And then uh, I don't know how to say, I don't know how much value we have to that in terms of economic terms or uh, in area. In the area is about, uh, let's say, the intertidal area is about 60%, uh, that means about uh, mm, 100 hectares of uh, harvesting areas in the, in the Santander Bay. Okay, and, and has the industry um, uh, got better since they reduced the sewage that's, um, you know, since that sewage has been redirected into the ocean? Yeah, the, well, the, all the charges uh, went to the, to the uh, sewage outflow, uh, uh, outfall now, and uh, we have only overflows. Overflows means that uh, when we have uh, rain, then we have uh, some the charges, but that means it's about uh, 5% of the uh, total discharge uh, we got uh, just uh, 20 years ago. Excellent, okay. So um, we've got um, a question from Karen Gibb. Um, how much effort goes into the experiments? So to value add to the mussels, are they sampled and tested uh, broadly? Um, IG, uh, sorry, EG, um, histology, chemistry, proteomics, genomics. Uh, that's from Karen in uh, Darwin, in Northern Australia. Uh, this is for me, yep. yep. Uh, I think so, yes. Okay. Um, we, we didn't test in terms of proteomics or, or, or genomics. Uh, we, we were originally going to test uh, some of the, the genetic impacts, but uh, it, it just didn't work out in terms of uh, uh, time and logistics. The, the setting up of the experiments, the first experiment that we ran took an awful long time uh, to, to set up uh, in terms of months, but we've ran 
you know, uh, not just these experiments, but other experiments uh, associated with this. So we're we're sort of a, a honed uh, team now, and we can we can roll out that system in 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 about a week is what it takes us to to roll it out, and then we usually run those experiments from anywhere from about four weeks up to about three months or, or, or five months, depending on, on, on the questions that we're asking. Okay. Uh, but in terms of the muscles, uh, those quick and easy measures that we make uh, are the, the functional measures, and we designed a, a chamber that we can measure those in, in situ as well. Um, so trying to combine lab and uh, 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 field measurements as most people would know, as I'm sure you're all aware, it can be a difficult element. If you've just done 17 or 18 hours uh, sampling in the field, uh, having to come back and run assays afterwards can prove uh, very difficult as well. Absolutely. Yeah, we've all been there, I think. Um, so um, back to Stuart, and, and again, a continuation for Paul. How well did the data and experiment resonate with other scientists and decision makers? <laughs> the big question. <laughs> um, the, in terms of to other scientists, we're, we're, we're still in the process. We've published some of the material. Uh, we're still in the process of, of preparing other material. but. Any time I personally have, have made presentations uh, uh, on any of my experiments, they've also always been welcomed uh, and, and really well discussed at any conferences uh, that I've attended. In, in terms of uh, um, policy makers, uh, we, we still have to, to feed back that information uh, back into to policy. And I suppose that's one of the biggest sort of uh, uh, efforts that most scientists have to undertake is, is trying to get your findings translated uh, into some sort of uh, policy changes as well. I, I should just add for a couple of those experiments, in particular the uh, uh, intensity experiment, the response surface experiment, we did use concentrations that are used as uh, the standard uh, environmental uh, um, or the environmental standards uh, that are used in Ireland and we used those as our low doses and then we took different scenarios of intensities to look at uh, uh, sublethal effects but also at sort of uh, uh, lethal effects up the top end of those concentrations. So I would hope that in some way uh, we can make those comparisons uh, uh, and try to sort of underpin policy to some extent uh, by some of the tests that we've run. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I also have a question for you, Paul. Um, talking about the green engineering project that you're doing in conjunction with Working Group 2, um, and I think you can probably go to one of your final slides for that, what is your experimental setup for that? Um, how long are you running that for? Do you have any um, initial results at the moment from, from Dublin? Uh, the quick and easy answer in terms of results, no. <laughs> um, what do you call it? We, we're setting that up in uh, in Dublin Port. Uh, we're actually be finishing off setting up those uh, uh, tiles uh, next week. Uh, it's not the greatest uh, time to be working uh, out in the field. Uh, there's uh, cold and winter storms. Uh, uh, Ireland's uh, climate is not so welcoming as uh, Santander. <laughs> Uh, and many other countries around the world. Uh, although Jane is smiling in this photo, uh, these can pr uh, we're we're putting them up in the dock, so uh, up in Dublin Port. So we've ships going uh, past us, uh, big commercial and big ferries going past us uh, constantly. And any little bit of chop uh, associated with the water makes for quite difficult uh, attachment and and even steadying yourself. Uh, I, I think if we uh, had more time, we'd revisit and maybe find some more convivial settings uh, to put some of those tiles up. But I mean, uh, it's important to to put them where we have put them. It's also sort of connectivity with Dublin Port as well. So, mm -hmm. sorry, was uh, something somebody? 
I think we've got a little bit of interference. Don't worry. Carry on, Paul. We can hear you better than, than we can hear them. Oh, uh, we, we chose Dublin Port because it gives us that connection uh, 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 with Dublin Port. Dublin Port are really interested in sort of rolling out these effects. They're, they're undergoing major changes uh, down the port. They're uh, rejuvenating uh, and changing a lot of the, the seawalls. And they're very interested in using these sort of applications uh, to try and enhance biodiversity, prevent uh, invasives, all of those connections that are uh, existing already with the, the, the tile experiment as driven by, by Beth and, and the World Harbour uh, project partners. So it, it, it's worth the risk down the port. Uh, it, it, in the long term, uh, it'll pay dividends in terms of uh, industry getting involved and, and rolling out these elements. And how many sites have you got in Dublin? Uh, uh, we, we have two sites, so two sites, Dublin Port is, is very extensive, it, it covers a very large uh, area uh, of the front end of the harbour in Dublin, and so we can still maintain that kilometre uh, distance that the other harbours have between those sites. Excellent. And what's your population in Dublin? Uh, we're currently sitting at one point. 2 million uh, in the immediate catchment area uh, in Dublin, but in the greater Dublin area that goes up to about 1.8 million in those surrounding uh, satellite towns. Okay, and Jose, what's your population in, in Santander? About the, around the bay, 250,000 people. So we're talking about uh, a fairly small city there, but you've got a huge impact and, and you know a lot of users of that harbour. Yeah, because it's the main uh, the capital of the region, and then uh, half of the region is as around the bay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I don't think we have any uh, further questions tonight, gentlemen. I think. Um, uh, we're probably about up on time as well, unless anybody's got another quick question that they want to either uh, ask uh, Paul or Jose or want to um, type through to me and I'll ask them on your behalf. Um, so from our perspective at the World Harbour Project, um, it remains for me just to thank you once again um, for your great presentations tonight and thank you very much Jose for stepping in and doing that at the last minute for us. Um, this um, is the final webinar of this year, we don't have one uh, happening in December, we understand you're all going to be fairly busy um, and so once we get through into 2017 we will be sending you um, another invite out for the, the next one that's happening early next next year. Oh, it looks like, oh, bear with me one second, you were so nearly off the hook. Um, oh no, I think that's it, my, my, my screen just flashed, but I think um, oh, John Burt's also just added his thanks from Abu Dhabi. Thank you very much, John. Um, so I think, as I say, that's all for tonight. Thank you very much, gentlemen, and we look forward to the uh, next World Harbour Project webinar. Thank you very much. Good night. Okay. Thank you, dear Emma. Bye. 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 Bye.